I was telling my wife, we actually had like a good weekend this weekend. She didn't want to work. I didn't want to work. And I was like, yeah, that's <laughs> you're supposed to go to a weekend and come back recharged. But really, what you come back is you come back like more resentful because you're like, that's what I I just did what I want to do with my life. And now I'm here doing what I have to do, but don't want to do with my life. Right. Like, yeah, it's uh, time. It, it really is kind of, you know, the, the reason you don't have your kids eat dessert before dinner. Mm hmm. Yeah, that true. whole, uh, oh, but I, I'm full on the good stuff already. <laughs> exactly. Uh, how was Laughlin? It was good, man. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, it was a good turnout. Um, got to celebrate, you know, our cousin who just got engaged. Mm -hmm. She and, uh, her new fiance, uh, were out there. They joined. Huh? All right. Yeah, they were there. It was kind of cool. Um, some of the family from Texas came out, you know, the mm -hmm. <laughs> weird that we've got like cousins whose kids are like old enough to be joining us out there. You mm -hmm. know? Um, yeah, man. I, yeah. Other than the hairline, there's nothing that makes me feel old quite like that. <laughs> it's kids do it, man. That's I, I joke because I have a buddy at work who doesn't have kids and, you know, time is just time. Like it, I remember when I didn't have kids, like it, cre it was just they there was no difference between the years. But then when you have like this like measuring stick that's like right next to you and you're like, why is time going so fast? You know, like I, it needs to stop. And so that, yeah, you have that grand revelation when you see somebody who would like, wait, you were a kid. You're not a kid anymore. I'm yeah. not okay with it. No, like l legitimately today too had uh, one of the kids who's a sophomore who was just talking to me about like, you know, some of the teachers who she's known for a while. And she's like, and, you know, obviously you because you've been teaching me since second grade. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh. Oh, oh man. <laughs> oh, man. Second grade. This is now your 10th grade year. Uh oh, oh yeah okay yeah no nope. gonna gonna let this one sit with me for a little <laughs> while and see what happens yeah oh man that's fantastic all right let's before we get too too depressed let's <laughs> intro, jump into it welcome to the podcast blue collar scholars not long ago a group of brilliant minds met together at a pub to discuss their unfinished works they recognized the value of coming together around delicious beverages and having meaningful conversations. That group was known as the Inklings. The Inkle Do podcast here, we're working to be the second iteration of that group. So pour yourself a craft beverage, pull up a chair, and join the conversation. Uh, did you have anything good in, in Laughlin or anything? Yeah. So, you know, like one of the, the highlights of the trip every time is the you know, on Saturday afternoon, we pick someone's hotel room and everyone just shows up there. Typical Enfield mm -hmm. party with everyone bringing their own coolers and things like that. And so I had gone and gotten myself uh, a couple of different six packs. One of them was a Ballast Point Hazy IPA, mm -hmm. their uh, Hazy okay. Sculpin, which is really good because, of course, it is because Ballast Point, duh. Yeah. yeah. But the other one I got because I knew I would have at least that that I was going to enjoy. Yep. And there was this uh, Dragon's Milk White Stout. Okay, is it a, the Game of... It's not the Game of Thrones. No. Okay, no, no, no. okay. all right. But yeah, it's not a, Dragon's Milk. Right, no, no, yeah. It's just generically okay. nerdy. Not like okay. specific fandom nerdy. All right, so um, you got me. I'm, I, the name has me. Oh, yeah. Know. Same. But the name and then also the style, the fact that it was a white stout. A white stout. That like just instantly kind of piqued my curiosity. Um, and it turns out I didn't realize this at the time. I probably wouldn't have bought it if I had seen it just because mm. I've been burned before. But it's finished in like bourbon barrel. Um, oh, okay. And yeah. I like bourbon. But generally speaking, if I'm drinking um, a beer that's been finished in bourbon barrels... What I'm going to get is something like super sharp and biting on it mm. that is kind of interesting and fun for like a couple sips. Yeah. And then after that, it's like, ah, you know, a great I'm not, really, I'm not really experiencing the beer at this point. Mm -hmm. 
but this dragon's milk white was not that at all it was mm. uh it's a it is flavor profile very much a stout yeah um like it is roasted malts and those kinds of things and then also that bitterness that's kind of playing with it uh it was a super smooth drink though mm-hmm. uh, and there was a little bit of I felt like I actually got some bourbon notes in it, like some sweetness and some vanilla, which is like, it's kind of one of those things. If you're drinking a bourbon and you want to show off, like you just claim, mm, yeah, you know, there, there's that vanilla that's in there. Cause it, it is, it's there yep. every single time. Yep. Uh, but so it's like, that's what the bourbon barrel gave this one, which actually did play nice. Cause there was that mm. little kind of vanilla sweetness going with the, the roast and the bitters. Um, it was really good. It is definitely a beer that, you know, I'm probably like, I only had one while we were there. Um, and then I'll, it's probably one of those beers where it's like, you know, one of those in a day is good. It's going to be a long, slow sipper for me. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was tasty and there was a lot going on with it. Yeah. which has me kind of excited for going back to it again and seeing if I get the same things, if there's something else there yeah. that maybe I missed on the first try. When you're in the mood for something like that. But what yeah. what color was it? So it was actually, uh, it was more of like the golden. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you remember I've had, like I've that? had a blonde stout before. So and freaking I, before they went out of business had a blonde stout and I was like, Man, I call shenanigans. He poured it, and it was, you know, golden, yellowy, maybe a little moving towards amber, but, you know, like it was very gold hay color. And then I drank it, and I was like, that's a stout. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I like it. Honestly, it was kind of one of those things. Uh, it reminded me a little bit of the time when we were doing those coffee Kolsch, and it's like, mm-hmm. you know, everything, yeah. it, it was easier to drink from the can from the perspective of like it wasn't doing the mind trick thing on me yep, yep. cuz i couldn't see really mm. the color of it um but yeah man it was it was good and you know it is one of those ones i think the uh it's probably a beer that it's got so much going on with it i wouldn't feel confident about my ability to kind of pair it with a food Mm-hmm. It feels more That's like when one you of those drink on its own. Exactly. I'm sitting there having mm-hmm. a conversation with someone and having a beer while we do it. I, that feels like the move for that one for me. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I went down I, a completely different road. So I was making, I found this like one hour pan pizza recipe. Oh, okay. And so like it's pan pizza, like, like pizza hut pan pizza from scratch but in like an hour instead of having to like proof it over multiple days and stuff. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll buy. <laughs> and, and so I, I tried it once and it was okay, but I screwed it up and had to do some research on it. And I figured out what I did wrong. And so I made it again. And so firstly on the pizza, it's freaking good, dude. Nice. <laughs> like, it's really nice. good. But what you do in order to kind of cheat the flavor, because you can't actually like proof it and make, true dough right so you're kind of cheating and so one of the things that uh, the guy did is he he wakes up the the yeast in beer okay so like the the beer actually adds like a yeasty and malty bready flavor into the bread so like you're getting more flavor in the bread than you would like normally it would just be like a biscuit right just like flour It's it's a steroid shot for your bread yeah, like it just it adds flavor that would not normally have been there nice. because the yeast didn't have time to ferment and do all sure. of the good stuff that. So you're cheating, right? With some adding something fermented into it. And so what I did is I bought one that you know, like one of those big cans to because I needed it for the cooking and I was like, "You know what? I've never had before. It's Foster's." Australian for beer. Oh my and god! So I saw the big old giant can there. I was like, um, I kind of want to buy one, and so, <laughs> so I did. I got the green can. There's an ale, and it was surprisingly not as terrible as I thought it. Like I thought it was gonna suck a lot. 
Well, and if it, you want that experience, didn't. get the blue can of lager next time. And, and then, it's bad. And I, I mean, it's been a long time since I've had it, which tells me something that, like, okay, yeah. Even in my days when I wasn't particularly discriminating, yeah, uh, yeah, no, no, it was, yeah, it was not good. I can believe that because it was the flavor changed. So, like, when I first poured it, and it was super crazy because I wanted kind of a cheap beer because. So cheap beers for everybody, they overcarbonate them and they serve them ice cold because then you don't taste them because carbonation right. and temperature both impact taste. And so I wanted something super carbonated, so I knew I was going to get a cheap beer. And so right when I first poured it after cooking with it, I was like, hey, this is not bad. Like, this is surprisingly OK. But then after it warmed up, you know, and and you started tasting it and you're like, ah, OK, there's a little something there that's not not quite as nice. So, like, if you drink it cold and carbonated, it not terrible. So if you're you saying it, it there, was designed to be drank quickly? Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. That, those ones are slammers. Yeah. Except it's like a ginormous sure. can. It's like a keg in itself. So it's <laughs> it's you can't drink that thing that you'll drown. You know. I, but it's. I'm not gonna lie. I'm I'm a little bit relieved when you said that you found the Fosters because when you were talking about like, you know what I've never had, one of those big. I thought you were about to tell me that you decided to go for like a forty of malt liquor or something. Dude, I was looking at him. I almost got one. I've never had that either. I almost got one, but I didn't know what it was. Like I yeah. didn't, didn't want to Google it, so I was like, ah. I don't know what this is. It might be awful in my pizza, so I'm not going to do it. But I, Yeah, I don't know how it would play in your pizza, but I can. I, I feel fairly confident I pre- can predict how you would feel about drinking it afterwards. <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah, so that was interesting. It was fun. I don't know. Nice. I enjoyed it. For, for $3, I got my kicks out of it. Oh, yeah. Well, and again, it's kind of one of those things. You know, we, we've talked about it before, this idea that, you know, the, the quote that I stole from my seminarian buddy mm-hmm. who introduced me to beer snobbery. There's like a time and place for every beer. There is, you know, I, and like yep. that idea that. of I'm I'm making a pizza, and you know what, pizzas don't require a gourmet drink with them. Yeah, yeah, I love it, though, man, dude. Uh, that pizza's got the like the crusty cheese on the you know like because it's all the way up against the because I cook it in a cast iron skillet, yep. right? So it's got the crusty all around, dude. I freaking it was like one of those things where I like if I didn't want to. If I was okay losing the piece of pizza, like I would have spiked it. Like it was so, you're just like, yes. And then, dang it, I just spiked my pizza. This is exactly what I wanted it to be when I started out on this process. <laughs> I, was, I was like, yeah, it was a W, man. I felt freaking good. Love that for you. Oh, okay. All right. So on the polar opposite of that, we're talking about <laughs> hell. No, I'm just joking. Kind of. <laughs> Not exclusively, but yeah, no, no, no. It, yeah, it's gonna come up. <laughs> oh, no, go we, down. I don't. Uh. <laughs> well, according to Brooklyn, that's what it would be, right? The oldest down is under the <laughs> yep, yep. in the center of the earth, right? Uh-huh. Heaven is in the sky, which is kind of what we were talking about. Was you know the progression of understanding, and Lewis talks about that in the reflection on the Psalms because when you're reading the Psalms, they reference Sheol a lot. Sheol, Sheol. Yeah, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but yes, S H E O L. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's close. It'll be close enough. Yeah. Um, and he spent some time explaining it, which I thought was interesting because, you know, I I think through most of our experience, we think that their belief, that Judaism's belief, is the same as ours because we that's where our roots are, and we believe that the Old Testament people had the same beliefs as what we have now, right? Like Mm -hmm. we can have that egocentric kind of view of, of these things. I don't know if egocentric is the right word, but like, no, I mean, it 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 kind of like we're using ourselves as the example, but he, he spends a lot of time talking about how the psalmists being, um, I don't, I can't think of the words. I mean, basically fairly primitive in, in, in it. He's like, Sheol was not heaven. It was not hell either. He's like, it, right. was, it was more like the pagans around them, like the Greeks and the, all, all the people who had like the afterlife where it was just like a place that you went when you died. And it was just kind of a nothing place, you know, and, yeah. and it's pretty consistent across 
mythologies. And I was like, Oh, that's interesting. And it, I'm drawing connections in my brain. I'm trying not to jump ahead, but so that was interesting. But then he goes on to explain on how the, that idea progresses, right? Like how it, it changed from that's where we were to this is where we are now. Mm-hmm. And, and how there's so many critical elements in that you have to have a creation myth because the the Judeo Christian myth is unique in that God is the you know ex nihilo creator, whereas almost everything else is created something from something else. Right. There's already something there, and then when they say create, they mean that very human sense of creation where we yeah. rearrange what is there into right. something new, as opposed to. Uh, from nothing myself yeah. will it Just into like, being there is no created thing beyond the uncreated yeah. creator like an an yeah. actual creation like yeah. where there was nothing now there is thing yeah yeah it was and it was fun because lewis prepped me for my conversation with brooklyn too because she's like well okay i was like well god created everything well who created god yeah, very like because he actually says yeah. that he's like the logical if you're following the, yep. the reasoning well, who created god and i was like oh i'm ready for this <laughs> and i was like no he is uncreated you know he's the source of everything and but it was interesting how it's like you you needed that creation story and then you move into like sheol and then you start to get like this understanding of like the presence of god versus separation from God, right? Because then they weren't worried about heaven and hell. They wanted right. God with them now because that meant I was winning the war or I was the or I was the kingdom on top. Yep. Or if God was away from me, then I was enslaved by the conquering armies. You know, like it was very here and now and it Pestilence, was plague and death. Yeah. Yeah. The the presence of God. Like if God was with me, I was winning. If God was separate from me, I was losing. And then that is kind of the framework for how we get to heaven and hell, because he reframes that heaven and hell is not, you know, heaven is not flowers and rainbows. It's really with God and hell is not necessarily flame and pitchforks. It's separation from God. Yeah. You know? And, and so it's, I thought it was really interesting in how even in our own faith, it has developed kind of like I'm watching my eight year olds understanding of the faith develop. Yeah, man, absolutely. And I think that's kind of one of the analogies that I come back to a lot when I'm talking to to students and even just in my own head and in my own mind is the reality that like when we watch how God reveals himself to his people, it's not that different than watching how like a parent and child come to know each other. Mm-hmm. You know, this idea of um, these phases and these developments, you know, like even when the one that I use it with the most is like the 10 commandments, you know, with your, with your girls, it's not like you start off day one telling them, okay, look, because the stove is really hot and if mm-hmm. you touch it you're going to hurt yourself you say hey we don't go near we don't play around the stove yeah why because the long explanation they're not ready for so you keep it short and as they get older then you can start explaining the reasons behind rules mm-hmm. and those kinds of things and yeah in the same way when we look at this idea of closeness to god and proximity to god they weren't ready and you know i'm not trying to sound arrogant like i'm totally ready for god to just let me know how things are now but i have the historical advantage right of i've got these we stand on their shoulders of looking at how god has continued to reveal himself and so you know yeah i it isn't that um god is going to punish me if i eat the fruit from this tree it is that God desires me to have a relationship of trust with him. And Mm -hmm. if I choose to reject his teaching and try and insert myself above him, then I have chosen to walk away from God. Mm -hmm. And he's going to allow me to do that because he's given me free will. 
and all of those bad consequences are not God punishing me. Those bad consequences are what God was trying to save me from when he laid out the commandments that would keep yeah. me from experiencing those. Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny. I like the way that you frame that because there's always the question of why, you know, why is there evil in the world? It's like, it's storming outside and you walked out the front door and then you said, why am I wet? You know, like it's, it's like, you're so shocked. It's because you freaking walked out in the storm. Like you left yep. God and now you're wondered why you're surrounded by evil. Like, yeah, like it's, that's it is kind that, of it. It is that meme. Well, 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 yeah. it is the consequences of my own actions. <laughs> that's, yes. I mean, <laughs> Oh. And like, we can laugh about it, not because we haven't done that, but because we have. Right. And like, right. we've got the Absolutely. advantage of knowing that, like, when we complained to God about, you know, I, I jumped in the pool and now my hair's all wet. Like, we, we know we've got the experience of having encountered God in ways where he does things like, yeah, yeah, it'll do that. Here's a towel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't, God fortunately is not petty like I am because I, I am not super quick to be uh, very compassionate in my explanation to students mm -hmm. when they come to me and are like, wait, but Mr. Enfield, why is my, why is my score this? Well, because there was a rubric here that spelled out what you needed to do. And you may notice that's what I scored you on. Yeah. Kind of like I told you. And when they're like, well, but I had this is, oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool story. And, bro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, wow. Sounds rough. I mean, ultimately. Yeah. In a much slower pace than God. Thank goodness for my sake. Uh, I do eventually get there, mm -hmm. but like where it's like, okay, cool. so here's what we need to do to fix it. Here are your yeah. options. Yeah. What are you going to do? And so we've got that experience. And so we can kind of laugh about the idea that, yeah, no, when we find ourselves struggling, it's not because God has abandoned us. It's because God who created everything and knew what the consequences of different choices were going to be mm -hmm. tried to warn us, Hey, don't do that because, but before he got to don't do and about yep. the part, we just, Sprint do, 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 off in do. the opposite direction. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. I agree. And it's, it was interesting too, because that, that is like a lot, that is like the larger context surrounding it. And one of the, the cool like threads to run through that was how Lewis said that he thinks God did that intentionally, that mm -hmm. God intentionally had the psalmist or revealed to the psalmist that there was, chill that that's that's all you need to know right now and then it layered and layered and he said his thought was that if he had talked about heaven and used that as the motivation then it would have logically ended in a humanistic use of god to get to heaven but instead what he did is god kept himself as the center by creation through these things and and defining everything as away from me and close to me, you know, hell is away from me, heaven is near me. And so God's maintained this kind of center role through all of it so that we did not come to the conclusion that I should use God so that I can get to heaven. No, he, he maintained it so that we were in relationship with God and not yeah. using him. Yeah, absolutely. And not that oof. I, I'm wanting to be careful, but eh, forget it. Just not gonna go. happen. I can't come up with it. <laughs> I can't come up with a better way to phrase this. You know, uh it didn't work. You know, <laughs> I mean, like it did work. It, it's right. better. And we have, you know, the advantage we have is that we've got the entire context mm -hmm. to like point back to and to remind ourselves and to correct it. But yeah, because that attitude is exactly what's kind of developed, mm -hmm. you know, like think about, 
think about the number of, you know, really solid uh, Christians who talk about things, you know, like end of life stuff where they're like, oh, man, you know, I just can't wait to be done with this and be in heaven. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, while understandable in a lot of those contexts for people who are suffering through extreme illness mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, um, just the exhaustion of having lived such an incredibly full life and having gone through so many losses and then being like the one who's left here and those kinds of yep. things. Like it's a totally understandable thing. But again, when they're talking about how ready they are for heaven, what they're really talking about is I'm ready to be done with earth. Yeah. Because if it was about being close to God, then we would be seeking to be close to God on earth mm -hmm. and trusting that he would bring us a place even closer in heaven. Yeah. But that's not ultimately what we're really focused about. Yeah. Or when you hear people talk about what are they looking forward to in heaven? You know, like you were talking about with your oldest on last week's episode, talking about this idea of, you know, grandpa wanting to see siblings, wanting to see, you know, and all of that is, you know, totally understandable and makes mm -hmm. sense that, yeah, I would love to reconnect with, you know, the people who we, I've lost. But that can't be the first thing I'm saying. Right. Because if it is, if that's the first thing, then it's not heaven I'm seeking. Right. That's true. That's absolutely true. Yeah, that's, uh, and, and it, I mean, thanks to our, you know, our own ability to screw everything up. You know, just like, and we are gifted. We are. Oh boy, we are talented. And the, you know, because the law, right, had the same intent, and and we took it to Phariseeism, right? Like we took mm -hmm. it to the extremes of of law, and then we said, no, it's grace, right? Faith and grace. And you're like, okay, but then we take it to the extreme, and then you're like, and so you know, like I, I think there is the pendulum swing, right? Where we yeah. have the center where we know it is. And we are, we're constantly coming back to center, but we do swing to the extremes. And so I think, yeah, the, the conversation around heaven and hell should really be because anytime I hear people talk about it and I hear them frame it in the presence, you know, heaven being in the presence of God, the, the immediate statement after that is, it, it starts now. Like it's not a later thing. Right. God is not separate from us. This is practice. Right. And this, that's, I tried to explain that to my, my daughter too. I was like, this earth is practice, right? We're practicing our relationship. Like we're practicing getting close to God. Like there's a lot of things that we're trying to figure out and do here. And, and, but it's about, about God. Right. It starts here. It doesn't start in the future. You don't wait until the end. It's like waiting, holding on for vacation until retirement when yeah. your knees are broke, when you have a double knee replacement and bad back and you can't travel because your feet, you know, like that's stupid. Like yeah. travel, travel now when you're healthy and you can enjoy it type of, you know, like it's the same principle. Well, and again, like it's also this idea of, you know, if being in God's presence, is what's going to make us happy and that's what and that's heaven why why would you not want to be happy now mm -hmm. and like oh, again man. the problem is Stop that we've going. confused ourselves we don't mm -hmm. actually believe at least not all the time we don't actually believe that being with god is what will make us happy we believe that being with God will provide us the things that we want to be happy. We've yeah, made God okay. a means rather than the end. Yeah. You know, that's I was gonna why, say, Oh, I'm not going to do this stuff because then God will be angry and he won't allow me to be happy as opposed to, I want to be close to God because that is where happiness is. And whatever God brings me with that, those things that God brings are my stepping stones to get to him. Yeah. Not the other way around. And I'm I'm glad you expounded on that because I was gonna I was gonna 
challenge in there a little bit because my thought was that you know happiness is not the goal i would say from our life experience i would say meaning is our life you know like to dry like you have to yeah. go through sucky stuff to learn to grow to get what god wants you to have but we want to like you were just saying we want him we go to god just so that he he gives us the things that we want and i think that was the critical point and and with that all wrapped together, I think of the dwarves in in uh, the black dwarves in Narnia who yep. chose consistently to not. They chose not to go with Aslan, and so you got to think about that's now. If it if now is practice, and you're choosing heaven, not God, you're constantly choosing something that's not God. So when you get to the pearly gates, it's quite possible that you don't choose God because you have had a lifetime of experience not choosing him, but choosing something that you wanted from him. Right. And that's exactly it. Because what you're doing is you are creating, because if it's not God, it's not heaven. And so what you've done is you've created a false image of heaven in your head. And when mm. you get to the real thing, it ain't going to be that. Yeah. Yeah. And so it is mm -hmm. entirely possible that when you see what heaven actually is, the fact that it does not match what you have built heaven up to be for yourself that you might actually reject it. Oh God. Could you imagine that that hurts me? So could you imagine looking at heaven and being disappointed, feeling I mean, disappointment like that? That's the most bonkers concept, but you're right. That you would have gotten there and you would be upset because it's not what you thought it was going to be. And yeah. that, that's just, it's wacky. And, and, and it's the risk. Mm -hmm. And like, I mean, it is the risk because we're created in God's image, but we're not created gods. Mm -hmm. Heaven isn't for me to create, mm -hmm. but it's a constant temptation for me to, yeah. it's a constant temptation for me to think that if things were just, if it, if just this, and if only this, then, yeah. and it's like, no, that's not my yeah. job that's not my role and for me to try and like seize that i mean it, it sounds a lot like i will not serve yeah uh and i, mean, I know how that story ends yeah i mean i think really about don't it. want it to be mine in the presence of god at mount sinai they still built an idol yeah that's heaven right like building an idol in the presence of god and like you were looking at him and you chose something else because you wanted yep. it. That's, that's how, oh, yeah, man, I'm freaking fired up. But anyway, <laughs> we got to get into a life lesson. I want to hit one something real quick that I had yeah. an epiphany in the creed. It always threw me off that, you know, Jesus went down to Sheol and came back or whatever, or they say hell. I had some of the hell, yeah. and, and so like, it always threw me. I was like, well, God went down. Jesus went down into lava and flame and pitchforks and Satan. But no, and then there was different terms. That's I've heard Abraham's bosom, which is yeah. Sheol, and like all these different things. But it made more sense in the perspective of that it wasn't like lava and pitchforks. It was like this nothing afterlife of, you know, like the Greeks had type of thing. So yeah, when you're reading the creed, if you hear that and you see that, uh, it's a language thing, I think, and a historical thing that's worth looking into. But um, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest and say like I feel like both of our life lessons are probably going to be the same. And that is like draw close to God and don't tr seek anything else. Right. Like, I mean, yep. that's the life lesson of that, like of all of it. Right. Like, I mean, is there anything else like just God, nothing else? Yeah. I mean, well, so you might've had something and I'm sorry, I took it. Away no, 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 I was actually like, that is exactly it. Except I want to tweak phrasing a little bit, please seek God, welcome everything else. Mm. Because like, it's not about rejecting things. It, it's about pursuing God above all else. And, you know, when God blesses you in that pursuit by saying, Hey, here's this woman who's going to go on that journey with you as your bride. And you two are going to help each other get closer to me because I'm going to speak to you through her. I'm going to speak to her through you. Mm. 
And then I'm going to bless you with these two incredible little girls who are going to show you so much about what I mean when I say I love you as your father. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do that. And it's not about rejecting them. It's not about rejecting, you know, your love of writing. It's not about rejecting my love of teaching. It's not about rejecting uh, the good things in life, whether that be mm. a pan pizza you've made by cheating with a cheap can of Foster's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But like, it's not about rejecting those things. It's about recognizing them for what they are. Mm. Stepping stones that God is allowing us to use to get that little bit closer to him than we were before the last time. But that we've got to keep that order right. I was just thinking. They are there to bring us to God. God is not there to bring them to us. Yep. You said the word order, and that's exactly where my brain went, was properly ordered. Yeah. Make sure the the things are the things, right? The the means are the means, and the end is the end, and we don't try to make God a means to, to our own end. Yeah. The yes. only thing to pursue, to actively chase down, is God. Mm. And when you're doing that, a lot of other things are going to be given to you by him. Mm. And we accept those because well that's said. what our loving father does is he gives us gifts. Well said. And we as his children, we accept them. But we don't seek them. My dad mm. stopped giving me gifts a while ago, mm -hmm. like presents for birthdays and things like that. It's not because he doesn't love me. It's because that's not where our relationship is now. Right. If he decided to give me something again, awesome. Be stoked for it. But- it's, it's my dad mm -hmm. that I want to spend time with, not any of the stuff that kind of comes with it. Right. Right. Hmm. That was good. I think I needed that as the right. That's, that's a good cap. I like that one. Hmm. Yeah, Teamwork sit, on that one. Sit, sit on that for a little while. Boy, that was good. I'm, I'm freaking juiced, man. <laughs> yeah. oh. Good luck going to bed now. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, yeah, good conversation and coffee, drinking coffee after 2 p.m. Two things that'll keep you up at night. So uh, that's what it is. But if you need coffee in the morning because you couldn't sleep at night because of an amazing conversation, we would like to provide that coffee for you. Uh, hop on the website, order a couple bags. That's how you could support these meaningful conversations. Uh, plus, we just love roasting coffee and sending it to people. We hope, uh, hope it serves you. So uh, you got anything else on your brain there, man? So much, but nah, it'll all hold for another week. Deal. That works for me. All right. With that, everybody, we will say adieu.